My name's Chris Dancy, as I said. My story's kind of one that's documented here and there. I do a little bit of corporate innovation stuff with companies. I spend a lot of time on TV. I don't know why I'm not that interesting. And, I just, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story today and uh, kind of this post-internet world. I was probably the first person on the planet who became the internet. I, I just said, I, I need to figure this out. And in about 2008, I took a hard look at my life, and I was spending a lot of time in front of screens. As a child who was raised in the 70s, I was still in front of screens. My first computer was 1979. You know, I had a computer before most people even knew what they were. I loved computers. They organized everything for me. I had computers through my adult life, and then around 2006, 2007, I decided I was never going to go offline. Well, what does never going offline mean? 180 pounds and kilograms. Chris Dancy taler til sin telefon, og det er langt fra det eneste elektronik han har med på løbebåndet. One, two, three, four, five devices. I alt fem instrumenter, så alt hvad hans krop registreres. I det hele taget måler han stort set alt i sit liv. I'm just logging my food. That's how much food I've eaten so far. That's how much in calories I have left. Det hele ender hos Google og andre online tjenester, der giver ham statistik på det meste. Our calories, sleep, sexual activities. I need to get laid. Um, temperature, heart rate, standing hours, dietary sugar, carbohydrate. So everything iron. is tracked. Oh yeah, I'm the most connected man in the world. <laughs> det startede egentlig for nogle år siden, da han var en overvægtig softwareudvikler. Yeah, I was completely a different person. As you look at all the things you could measure, you start to understand how you'd behave. And then you lost quite a few pounds. Oh yeah. Og nu er han så omrejsende med det budskab, at man skal udnytte de muligheder teknologien giver. What's the weather tonight? I stedet for at frygte overvågning. The minute you go to a doctor, you say here's my privacy. The minute you get a driver's license, you say here's my privacy. So you're saying that we've lost our privacy anyway? Yes, for for so long. Ifølge amerikaneren selv, så er han dog ikke så fremtidsagtig endda. I can take these off and be I can be human. <laughs> so becoming the internet's pretty easy. And I believe that you guys are a lot like I am. While you might not have a body full of sensors or a house full of toys, you will. And as you get these things, you have a choice to make about how you interact with them and what you value. And as most of us know, we now talk to the internet. A child born in 2016 will be taught by machines. Right? Some children's first words will be, hello Siri. And as we talk to machines, it creates this paradigm shift because no longer do we select a decision. We're told what the answer is, right? If I'm in my car and I say, Siri, play Madonna. She just plays Madonna from Apple Music, not Madonna from Spotify, not Madonna from another service. So as we limit our ability to interface with technology, the choices in companies that have access to that are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. This is profound, because while the interface disappears, the choices become smaller. Interface gives you choice. And I don't see people talking about this in the news. It's easy, but that doesn't mean it's right. Easy is not right. It's easy. And I think it's time we talk about the difference. Which brings us to the question, now that the internet has left the room, what does that mean for privacy? I actually don't believe in privacy. I think privacy is one of these things that once we unpack it a little bit, we'll find hurts us more than helps us. If you want to know anything about me, you can go to data.chrisdancy.com. It's all there. I'm not that interesting. Spend all your time figuring it out, all right? I just think if we got through it, we'd understand that we're all better off being transparent with each other. But we have a lot to blame with the privacy debate because as people, we love data. And governments love data. In the United States, we passed something in 2001 called the Patriot Act. In 2007, Snowden leaked what was called PRISM, which was the surveillance of the internet. In 2008, Barack Obama couldn't have a BlackBerry because it was not secure. By 2014, the White House had hired a data scientist. By 2015, the president was wearing a Fitbit. Look at this. In 2008, he couldn't have a BlackBerry 
in 2015, his heart rate and sleep could be sent to a server in California. Where is the news on this? O not okay, okay? No. If you're worried about privacy, look at your leadership. They have no clue. If you and then you wonder how we got Donald Trump. <laughs> I'm not smart. I'm doing what we used to do. I'm paying attention. That's what we did in the 90s before we had a bunch of computers. And See, every time you hear the word privacy, I want you to think economic disparity because privacy doesn't exist for the poor and it doesn't matter to the rich. The rich don't care about privacy. It doesn't matter. They're rich. And the poor, doesn't, they don't have any privacy. It's just us in the middle. We're stuck. And the only thing we have is the secrecy around our lives. And corporations have all that in spades. But we could take this data and do something different with it. What happens if we use the NSA for one hour and we looked for good? No terrorism, just one hour. We're going to take all the resources and say, look, find me some good in the world. We'd find it. Let's hunt for good organizations for one hour. And hey, Apple, let's take those devices, those billions of devices, and let's solve cancer, illiteracy, and domestic abuse. One hour. This is not impossible. This is a choice we're making as a people because we refuse to have the conversation. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be upset, but I think it's time we talk about this and we stop fetishizing the future. Because the future doesn't care about us. We care about us. We're here now. Last thing, we need to build solutions for every single person on Earth. $1,000 phones, tablets, $300 wearable devices don't help anyone. And most of the people on Earth are that group of people. Because I believe it's neither, if it's not accessible to the poor, it's not radical, and it's not revolutionary. Every single person deserves access to technology. Every single person can be freed by it. Thank you so much.